Hello. Hey, there we go. Excellent. Welcome, everybody. Um, this is for the OpenStack Trove hands-on lab. Looks like a lot more people than uh, we initially thought were going to be here, but that's awesome. Love seeing that. Um, my name is Craig Vivial. I am uh, the, P the PTL uh, working on um, the Trove platform now. Um, I work for HP. Um, I've, I've been involved with uh, Trove for a couple years now, um, pretty much since the inception of it. It was uh, originally working with uh, Rackspace and HP coming together, and, and then Tesora, and we've got eBay and, and uh, Red Hat. A couple other people have come, come on board as well. So we have a couple people around here. Um, uh, we have uh, Nikhil here, who's the uh, former PTL. Uh, he's, uh, he's, he's someone in that can uh, help us out as well, as well as Shane, uh, Max, Amrith. Um, we have Doug back there. And then uh, we also have uh, Peter, who's I'm sure around. There he is. Um, as well as uh, Victoria. Is she here? There she is. And Eddie. We have, we have quite a few people around. So if you, if you run into any trouble, with um, copying these, um, the disk image and getting that set up, sure we can uh, raise your hand and uh, we can come come around and help you out. Is everybody uh, starting the uh, copying process? Yeah. No. Oh, do we uh, have any more ha uh, do you have drives? Any more drives here? Anyone who's finished copying? Anybody who's copied, start sharing them around, please. That's the reason we sent a RSVP request, but the tone was kind of different from what's here right now. Yeah, there's quite a few more people than we thought. I think we had we said about 20 to 30 people, and it looks like got quite a mi bit more. <laughs> so commence file copying. <laughs> so we're going to be copying all the files off the thumb drive uh, onto your machines. Um, and we're going to be running with um, uh, VirtualBox. No. Uh, no, sorry, VMware. Um, ideally Fusion um, on the Mac, and then um, it's a uh, workstation on on um, on Linux or Windows. There's another one. There's one right there. So whenever you finish, put your hand up with the, with the drive, and that'll help that'll help us uh, move it along a little better. Um, so once you've completed, we'll move, we'll move that along. All right. So a little bit of um, preparation here. We have a plan. We're going to get this uh, set up on your, on your laptop, and then we'll talk a little bit about what is Trove. Um, if, if, uh, if you've never heard of it or you're, you're semi-familiar with it, then we can, we can expand that. Uh, we're going to be creating a MySQL instance, and then we are going to be creating a user and a database, and then making a backup of that and showing how easy that is with our uh, Trove, Trove CLI. And, and that's just working through our API, uh, similar to all the other OpenStack projects we have a CLI written in Python. Um, then, we, then we're also going to be showing one of, the, one of the things that kind of separates Trove away from other projects just being a, uh, a provisioning system, we can also customize and tune MySQL, Mongo, Redis, all the different data stores, and we can customize their actual configurations. So we can create a customization um, group, configuration group that you can then apply to multiple instances, and that allows you to, maybe you need to improve the, or increase the connection count or um, the memory that you you're using for for certain um, certain configuration settings. Am I moving any too fast here, or are we uh, we on good pace? What's up? Yes. Um, we do have those in a uh, in a in a Google um, Drive um, f folder, but. What do you mean? But it's not very good to copy that from this network, is what we've noticed. So it's. 
Oh, to a cloud instance? It's not something we actually thought about whenever we initially did that, but <laughs> to be able to um, pull this into a cloud instance and run it from that. I can tell you why we didn't do that in the past. Why didn't we do that in the past? In a conference setting, it's not always ideal to use a uh, the network. <laughs> Um, we could, um, so we do have a, uh, so if you go to my Twitter account, it's Twitter slash CP16net. I posted these slides up, and so you can at least see those slides there. Uh, it should be the latest uh, tweet that I have there, I believe. It should be linked to a Google, a Google link, right? Did you find that? Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Excellent. Any other questions as we're getting started here? Excuse me? A Twitter account is CP16net. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Amrith. Thank you, Max. Excellent. Any other questions? Um, you see the Twitter account, you can get the... Any other questions as we're moving along here? In such an orderly fashion. <laughs> okay. So how many uh, people have actually completed the copy process so we can kind of get a gauge of how far along we are? Okay, okay. like 10 people, like, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> excellent, there's another one. All right. Do you have, here's another one. The loading for the VM? Yeah, because I have to check if network works. I'm just running it. Oh, the, the so um, the login is OpenStack. Uh, username and the password is password. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> All right. Excellent. They need to restore the most recent snapshot. To restore the most recent snapshot. Go back to the most recent snapshot, which is on that. Also, they need to do the network, they, you do need to network yeah. configuration. Okay. So, so as, we're, as we're moving forward here, we, uh, there's a couple things we need to like tweak before we start up the VM and, and be able to get, get things completely working there. But you're on the right track. Excellent. Um, can I get another quick show of hands of how many people have uh, completed copying? Excellent. All right, don't launch the VM quite yet, all right? So let me, uh, let me go into a couple Trove terminology things, and then we'll get to, uh, um, we'll talk about Trove for a second, and then we'll um, get into the VM. So there's a couple things in Trove that are, that are unique to Trove. We have uh, a Trove instance, which that, that, that basically wraps up a Nova instance that's uh, booted for you that's running a guest agent. That guest agent is a Python uh, code that is connected to the RabbitMQ that, that listens for events, that prepares, creates databases, creates instance for you. Um, there's a, there's a notion of a flavor, same as uh, within Nova, it's actually using the, the same Nova flavors, um, which, is, which constitutes the RAM and the disk size. Um, the guest image, we have a unique guest image for each one of our data stores that, um, that helps you provision. Um, it, it contains, the guest image is just a glance image that contains the, um, the guest agent already on there. 
It also, um, you can, you can pre-install your um, data store as well, which may, may be MySQL, maybe Redis, maybe Mongo, maybe other data stores. Um, that data store is one of the um, databases that we have um, as well. And then we have versions. So we have a data store version, a version being you can have a different version of MySQL. You can have MySQL 5.1, MySQL 5.5, MySQL 5.6, MySQL 6.0, I think, is the next one, is what I recall. Um, 5.7 dot X. <laughs> um, then we have uh, the configuration group, which is basically a set of configurations per data store. So for, for example, in MySQL, you can set the max connections. You can set uh, the buffer pool size. You can um, set specific things like that and apply those. So with, uh, with Introve, we have a couple dependencies that we have within that. We, have, we depend on Nova. That's um, providing the compute resources, which is the instance where your database is running. We have a, a notion with Cinder. Cinder is providing the actual storage backend. That's where, um, for example, in MySQL, you have varlib MySQL. That is where um, we mount the um, volume. So it stores all, all of your data in a volume that then can be replicated, can be detached if needed. Um, basically gives us a little bit more flexibility to be able to not contain everything on that instance. If your instance dies for whatever reason, then we, can, we have a way of getting that data back. Uh, then we have uh, dependency on Swift. That's where we're storing your backups. Uh, you, you back up your database, it's going to uh, object storage in Swift. Um, Neutron. We're able to. You can make a private subnet. You can you can connect you can connect uh, basically your entire application within that subnet. You can then um, lock down the permissions for your data store um, not to have access basically to the the public network or lock down to just your your network and not to other other services outside of that. Uh, and then we have Keystone, which is basically dependency of making sure that you have tenant networks or, or your instances are living within that network. Um, I'm sorry, within validation of your tenant, right? So you can, um, tenants are basically instances that live within, uh, different ins um, within different tenants. Does that make sense? Or did I just ramble on for a little bit there? <laughs> Uh, and then Glance, we have that. That's where we're storing our, our image. Uh, any questions around that? Excuse me? Heat. heat um, there's, we do have support for Heat um, to be able to build, um, build the instance and tie everything together with Heat, uh, although that's not, been a, um, that's not been part of the pipeline that we've been testing very well. Um, so that's something that it exists, but hasn't been fully vetted and tested. I, the, way I, the way I've looked at it is that um, there's kind of a double, if, if you look at it like you have heat and then you have what Trove is, heat can build a Trove instance and, and run along. And then you also ha then would have Trove building, using heat to build it. So it would be like kind of this inception type of building within a building and it, it provides the same functionality, but the Trove actually provides extra on top of that. So I, don't, I, look, f I look at it like not necessarily, um, but there can be discussions on that. Um, and I'd love input and in seeing what the direction that we can take that as, as a community. It, the question was, uh, does Trove support heat? And we do support, heat supports Trove. And there, the, then there's the idea is, does Trove actually use heat to provision its resources with it? So that's kind of a double answer to that question, sort of. <laughs> Any other questions about that? So we just, um, in Liberty, we just released it with uh, MySQL clustering. It's actually using the Percona ExtraDB cluster, um, is the one that we 
officially support right now. Um, it's using um, the master master uh, with Glare. Excellent. Yeah, so we have we have replication as well with master slave and uh, master master as well. Excellent. Any other questions? How many of you still need to copy software? I think everybody's copying. How many people are still copying? We've got some extra drives if we need to still get some copies made. Do you still copy or do you need to copy? Do you still copy? Excellent. Do you need a thumb drive? Anybody else need a thumb drive? Excellent. So we have, uh, here's a diagram of how Trove interacts with um, all the different services within OpenStack. So Trove API is the endpoint. Um, that's where uh, Horizon or um, the CLI enters with, the, um, with our Trove API. And it connects to the database as well as the message bus. Message bus being uh, Rabbit or whatever other OpenStack supported Oslo messaging service is available. Um, that, that then, if you create an instance, we'll go through and we will pass that to the message bus and then goes to the task manager. Task manager is meant for long running tasks like let's create an instance, let's create a volume, let's create a network, let's tie all that together. Let's make sure that actually comes online and, and becomes active. Um, so then task manager then passes that along to uh, Nova and creates creates the Nova instance, creates the sender volume, and um, attaches that volume, and then we we end up having a compute instance. What that compute instance is the image from Glance that has the um, the guest agent as well as the data store for SQL or NoSQL that we have in our is in our diagram. Guest agent then prepares that instance, uh, installs installs that data store, secures that data store and make sure that we attach that volume into the correct location and format that and set it up to where it's active. Um, so then um, the other, we see the guest agent also um, goes down and points to Swift. Well, that's for the backup. So we call in from the Trove API, we say, hey, go create a backup, and then it'll go down and it will, the guest agent then can uh, put that into the Swift container for, for the tenant um, as the backup. You had a question there, sir? That sounds like a scam here because you're connecting the guest agent, which is running in a VM, right. to the control network of OpenStack. Right. So this is uh, this this has been um, a talk uh, quite a few times. This is this has been brought up. What this means is that um, the question is uh, we have a guest net or guest agent that's connected to the control plane for the message bus here. You see that. Um, so we locked. So uh, you have a you have a Nova instance, and if this there's there's um, what we have set up in our dev stack environment is that each one of the compute instances is in the tenant tenants. So technically, in that in that type of uh, setup, it's not exactly secure, and that that means that it's it's uh, you can actually SSH you can. You can get in there. You can then see those credentials to the to that instance. Not a production type of setup, for the record. <laughs> so 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 we've um, so actually Nikhil just uh, brought in a, uh, a making a remote um, patch. Um, it's something that we can then create those instances in an admin tenant, where those those exist in this other tenant, but we give access to the the endpoint to that right so you have the network basically you're attaching that to the network to your private subnet so then you have access to that and then you don't actually have access to the instance to the volume or to anything else inside of that instance so you are creating service VM. There was a that was going to do that. okay that answer your question okay Any other questions about that then, as before we move on with this fun slide? Yes, sir. 
Yes. Yes, you can you can split. So you can't. The question is, can you split the task manager and conductor into three um, different controller nodes and be able to split the load? Is that and make it an HA and load balancing. So since uh, task manager is just connected to the uh, message bus, you can run that across multiple nodes and it will only a single um, message that gets passed to a task manager gets executed at a time. And then on the same, same, um, the same ideas with conductor, it's basically just listening to messages from, from uh, the guest agent saying, hey, the database is active or hey, we're ready basically change the state in the database of that trove instance. So um, that's, those don't need to be um, So task manager and conductor do not need to be running on AHA proxy or anything because it's running that, I would say yes, if you're running um, the message bus HA as well then. Then you would need some kind of a way to, to provide HA for the message bus at that point. Make sense? Okay. Uh, it does not provide it. The so the question is, does this, this doesn't provide um, a diagram for silometer and uh, meter, silometer? Okay. Um, so it doesn't provide um, a diagram of silometer in here, but it does, we do uh, provide messages to silometer for, for that. We're actually expanding. Um, we have some blueprints in the SNEC for Mintaka that have uh, basically expand our messages across all of uh, any state changes across any instance as far as resizing uh, the instance, resizing volume, um, basically any state changes. So we have the start, end, and error. error. Actually, Peter was actually working on that. So no, Morgan's working on that, but he knows a lot about it. <laughs> Excellent. Any other questions? Or did I answer your question correct, sir? Yeah. Any other questions? All right, so we should be about finished uh, getting um, everything copied. Everybody good for copying? I take the shallow nods as a yes. <laughs> All right, so there's a couple things here. Um, so it would be good to Emmer was saying to go back and, and set your uh, um, reset the instance to or your VM to the latest snapshot. There you go. So we so reset reset that. And before we start this up, then. So if we go in uh, to the settings that, or wait, to snapshots. Oh, you do not see that. So you go into the snapshots of that VM and then go to your latest snapshot. And this is probably my random snapshot that I have. All right, so then the, um, we have, so getting started here, we have, I have a couple commands here. You might not be able to see this, but if you, ha if you pull down the, the document on, um, from my Twitter account, uh, you should be able to see that in the PDF. Um, it's basically a manual way of setting up a virtual network on your, on your, um, your VMware. And this is, this is specific to VMware Fusion here. Um, there's a picture on the next slide here that kind of shows another way you can do it that's not as command line-esque. Um, basically going into your network uh, on, your, on your VM. So if we go back here and you go to the VMware Fusion preferences, you can go to the general, you'll see general here, and then you go to network, and then you can 
um, unlock things. Okay, we have issues with the snapshot. So launch the VMX. The VMX, not the VMDK. Once yeah, the VMDK is the click image. On virtual machine snapshot. You'll see one called DevStack shutdown. Click on that button. Okay. So what are you seeing? Installation. All right. You're going to get a whole bunch of boxes about did you copy it or move it? Click you moved it. You moved it. Do not upgrade things. Uh, for some of the stuff which we're doing, it may be, but make sure you have at least four if you want to downsize the image. Downsize it to four. Yes, sir. So if you have a 32-bit machine, this is not going to work. Anybody got a 32-bit machine? Don't bother. Uh, <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah, it won't work. Netflix and things like that. Um, and if you don't want to use 8 gig, you can downsize it to 4, but some things might run out of memory. So we have it set to 8 gigs initially? OK. OK. That's fine. Anybody? Having problems? Raise your hand. We'll come over and help you. Here you go, help. All right. You're about to get a lot of promotional material. So any, anybody uh, else having problems? No? Moving forward? What? I'm downloading VMware. Oh, OK. Yeah, it's taking a Good luck. <laughs> that might, uh, it, was it not on the, uh, the thumb drive? For Windows it was. Oh, OK. Not for Linux. Not for Linux. Gotcha. So the difference between what now? The difference between snapshot and the um, original image. The snapshot and the original image. I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, so you you could you couldn't get back to the uh, snapshot you said. Yeah. Um. on Linux, so I just imported the VMDK image, but I can't handle the VMS snapshot. So well, I would just try. Yeah, I. I Probably it's because um, DevStack was uh, shut down, and whenever you try to restart it, or if it's alive, if if it's running live, and you're trying to move this, and then it's like trying to bring all those services up again in a different environment. It's I've seen it where uh, um, the volume backend doesn't actually reconnect, so that what we have a script in there um, to. Uh, reconnect or re recreate and reconnect to your uh, sender volume back end. Um, yeah. Anybody else having any uh, troubles that we can help out with? There's a dev stacks shutdown or dev stack stop. Yeah, it's, yeah, it would be the last one there. That looks uh, DevStack's shut down. Yeah. So everybody get back to the DevStack shutdown snapshot. And... Did everybody create this network then is the next piece? Uh, the network being um, this virtual private network. Um, give a little. So 
So the VM is already connected to a 192.168.115.130, and it makes it a lot easier to be able to SSH into that machine and also to see Horizon dashboard from this. Uh, if you create this network first and then attach this network to your virtual machine that's your, before you boot it back up. And you can create that from, the, from this network control panel um, by just adding a new one and setting, this, setting the subnet and the subnet mask. What was that? The subnet needs to be, uh, yeah, 192.168.115.0. Oh, really? Okay. But you can still get. Still okay. Hey, did everybody get a chance to throw their sign up sheet? Anybody not sign up? I'll get to get it to you. Anybody else? No. All right, so we um, so moving moving along here. I think uh, everybody um, caught up to where we are. I hope so. So the next thing is making sure on this VM we're to make sure we have at least four gigs of RAM. Um, I think it was defaulted to eight, so you may be able may need to turn that down. At least we need probably a, at least four gigs though, um, from my experience. And then I've given it four CPUs. Um, that's, that's to make sure we can boot a VM and have the CPUs and RAM available um, to Nova. And this you can get to from the uh, advanced options on the VM or settings. OK. Another, another thing is to make sure we enable that hypervisor uh, setting as well. Otherwise, you're, you're going to get an error immediately whenever you create a Nova instance. Because the uh, the extensions won't be um, enabled, and we'll be able to use KVM for that. All right, so then we can uh, boot up the machine. Um, we have the login credentials there of OpenStack, and password is the password. Um, the first thing we need to do in, in this image is to CD into change the directory to op stack dev stack, and that's where we have dev stack set up. There's a script inside of there we can call bash restart dev stack, and that will bring up all of the services. Um, one you can either one way you can do this is to call is to SSH into this instance using um, uh, OpenStack at uh, 192.168.115.130. That's the uh, instance IP. So we have, uh, we have the, the instance IP of 192.168.115.130. Uh, you can do, from your terminal, you should be able to uh, SSH to OpenStack at that IP address if, you've set up, if the network is set up and correct. If not, you can actually just um, go into the console uh, for VMware and you can, you can use that with uh, 
OpenStack login and password is the password. And then as I was saying, go into the DevStack directory, um, call the, uh, the restart DevStack uh, SSH command with uh, bash. Yeah, that's why I, that's what, so you can't just execute that script without uh, calling, um, that's why you need to add bash SSH because there's no execute on that, on that script. So, and this should, and once you do that, it should bring up the screen session that shows all of DevStack running. Has anybody not signed in? Thank you. So we have the, uh, once we have that instance, or once we have the screen session running there, you can hit uh, control A, then D to escape out of that, and then you should get back to a console. Um, from there, let's, um, let's see, did I, did I have anything else? Is everybody caught up to where we have, we have OpenStack running? No? We have a few. Excellent. Okay. So the network set up? Yeah. This one or the other one? The other one. You're not able to ping the IP address, so that would mean that the network is not set up on that instance. So, so because that instance was set up originally on that network, and then it was moved, you don't have that network set up on your on your laptop. It's not going to know how to connect to that to that device, right? Makes sense. So that was that was creating this network in our um, in our. Uh, what is this, the global uh, VMware Fusion um, network settings, right? So we're going to create, create this network. Can you enlarge this in any way? Um, let me, I can, I can enlarge this if I go to my, this screen. Is this any better? How did I get to this screen? I will close it and I will show you. So I went to the VMware Fusion preferences. And then I have general mouse settings, default applications, and network. You do not, you do not have network. Somebody said that uh, because it was the evaluation version that you may have installed, that that may not have, may not have it. The what? Oh, yes. How did I open this window? From the, I went to VMware Fusion, then I went to Preferences. So I went to here to Preferences. And that shows up here. If you have, but we noticed if you have the evaluation version, you won't, you won't be able to get that, that. So the version of, Uh, okay, so it was it was the pro pro evaluation has this, but yeah. the version on the thumb drive does not. That's not on the thumb drive. That's not on the thumb drive. Oh, I'm confused now. <laughs> oh, you can choose between pro or the regular version when you install. There you go. Okay. Um, how are we doing here? <laughs> Everybody having fun yet? Because <laughs> 
Okay. Yeah, I haven't mentioned that yet either. But so, here's another poll question: How many people have actually been able to see DevStack startup? Excellent. Looks like we got quite a few over there. There you go. Excellent. Um, the next would be if. Uh, how many people have gotten the VM to boot up correctly? What was that? Z how many people still need help with uh, getting the uh, VM booted up correctly? So the goal is to get the with the with login into the open stack and password session, right? Yes. Once you're there, you're good. So you just wait for the next step. From, from, you'll run from there. Yeah. yeah. You should be able to run from there as well. But uh, do we need to shell into the machine? Um, you, you shouldn't need to, um, but it, it's helpful. It's helpful to be able to shell into the machine. So. Right, so this is this is saying that we don't have a, that network attached to your instance, then. So you have this you have this here, right? Okay. So you have to you have to shut down your machine, and then go to the settings of this of this VM under network and attach that. Um, okay. Okay. So now we have we have the preferences. We're looking in preferences. We see that we see we have the custom network. Okay, excellent. So then close, close out of the screen. Close this. And then go to your settings on this VM. And then go to network. And then we need to set this network. Okay, now that we have that, this is going to connect that network to that instance. And then now whenever you boot up the instance, you should be able to ping it. So what I was just describing there was once we have once we have our network set up, we have this network set up on this on this uh, on our VMware. Then inside for the instance that we have here, we go to the settings, we go to our network adapter, and then we set that we set this VM this private custom network to this to that to that instance and then then we can boot it up and it will have have that network access and then you should be able to shell into that um, the IP address like I was describing all right so can I get a show of hands of how many people got the network set up okay how about who still needs to set that up all right can we get some? Uh, who else needs needs a needs a hand? Anybody else need a hand here? Anybody else having problems with networking? The networking piece. So we have a, we have a hand over here. The blue shirt. Well, what's up? Okay. So. That don't have any uh, oh boy. network thing. All right. Um. Did you did you get the uh, slide that I have? Yeah. The slides. Um. Yeah. Do what? Okay. So I'd follow those steps in that in the slide there. If that works. How are we doing on time? Okay. All right, so does it look like we can we can boot it up?
Should see the machine uh, boot up here. stack at 2.168.1.01. All right, so once you've, uh, if you're able to SSH into your, into your box there, then we can, uh, we go into op stack, dev stack. Inside of that, inside of that folder, there's a uh, restart dev stack SH. And then this should uh, start at that screen session as we were saying. You should see something like that on the screen. Yeah? How many people see that? <laughs> Do we have quorum? <laughs> All right. So then once we're inside of there, we can source the uh, OpenRC with demo uh, um, username and demo tenant. So source OpenRC demo demo. And that will then allow you to then use the, the Trove CLI. So you should be able to use Trove List. Um, and that should, might take a minute for it to first uh, go through the Keystone authorization. And then you should get an empty list. Yes, sir. Um, there's no Neutron on this. On this. this. This is using Nova Network. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, the network setting doesn't show. Right. So, in that case, what do we do? We just run the commands? So, Doug Amrith, you said uh, whenever the networking isn't there for the evaluation, you just, can't, you just won't be able to do Horizon. You'll just be able to get to the, uh, um, you'll just have to use the uh, console window. And you won't be able to SSH into it, but it shouldn't affect uh, being able to to get in doing this inside of the console window. So we've so now we've uh, here's a slide showing we've uh, sourced the OpenStack RC and and using demo demo, and then we've able to to show, do the show of, um, trove list there. Everybody been able to see uh, show of hands of who who's been able to see a trove list. Oh, that's awesome. That's a lot better than I thought I was going to see. <laughs> Give yourself a hand. <laughs> All right. OK, so the next thing we can see is a flavor list. This will be the list of flavors that we can, um, that we'll be able to, that we can build an instance from. I do, um, we're only going to use, uh, we're going to work with two of them that are there. And that's flavor 7, which is the M1 RD Tiny, and um, uh, number 8, the M1 RD Small. Um, those are specific because uh, they're, they're set up to work with the image that we have set up on this instance um, from within DevStack. Um, there's, next, you should be able to do a data store list, which is uh, trove space data store dash list. Should be able to see my SQL in there. I can't blow that up anymore, sorry. It's kind of small. Um, everybody be able to see uh, my SQL? List, excellent. How about the version? Do a data store, 
data store version list and then giving it the, the name of MySQL, that will list you any of the versions that you have for that data store. So each one of these is a, is a specific uh, version that you can install for, for your instance. Next thing we can do here is uh, uh, create an instance. So we can, so in order to create an instance, we give, uh, we do a trove create, give it the name of the instance. We'll call this instance demo. Next, uh, next parameter is the flavor, which will give it seven. And those are positional arguments to the trove command. And then we'll give it dash dash size of one, which means we're giving it a volume of one, a volume one gig size. Everything is in gigs. Um, so we're giving it a one gig size volume. Um, the data store is we uh, pass in is MySQL. The data store version is 5.6. And then we can pass in optionally what users we want to automatically provision on this instance whenever we boot it. So we're creating a, a user one with a password of password. And I'll, sh I'll, I'll go through that here as well. Oh. So we got trove create. Oops. So we have trove create. If you don't type it with any parameters, it gives you a little help there. And that's helpful to make sure you, you can see what's going on, what you need to pass in. Uh, trove create. I'll give it demo for the name, flavor size of seven. Um, size of one, data store, MySQL, data store, version, underscore version, uh, with uh, 5.6, and then we give it a users of user one password. Excellent. And then once you, once you do that, you should see the, um, the payload that comes back giving you uh, the UUID flavor data store version name. Um, you may get a little uh, box that pops up. It's asking for, um, uh, for your network access to pr uh, promiscuous mode. Uh, if, you, if you enabled that um, in the network settings there. So then we, um, then once we have this instance in the build state, we can see it in the trove list, and you can see that it's in uh, the build state there. Um, you can also call it with trove show demo, and that's basically just calling the details of that single instance. And so you can see that. And while it's in building here, I'll just give it a watch command, and it should like sit here and every two seconds make that call. And we should eventually see that status that's in build, go to active. So what it's doing right now is it's actually, it's created, creating the Nova instance. It is creating that volume, attaching that form. And then, um, and then that it, um, once that instance is booted up and, the, and it's attached, then it will then make sure it pulls in the, uh, install, make sure that package is installed, which for this case is MySQL 5.6. Then it will, um, go into uh, making sure we mount the volume and format that volume in the correct location. And once that once it's mounted that volume there, then it will um, then it prepares the and then it prepares the uh, MySQL to uh, install it into that directory. So we're making sure that we we set up the users, we secure MySQL, we we remove anonymous root users access and basically secure that down with the, uh, um, with the commands. Magic, turned active. Ex you got a question? Um, yeah, so what are the prereqs for the guest image? What are the prereqs for the guest image? So for the, for the guest image, it is, uh, we have it as a, uh, it's an Ubuntu image by default, but we also have an ability of using um, uh, Red Hat or Debian or whatever other image that you have. As long as that instance has uh, the guest agent installed on it, 
and then is, uh, it can be configured to connect to your, to your control plane, which that would be the, um, the, the RabbitMQ uh, setup there. Then we have, uh, let's see, we have the guest, then we have, we have the uh, data store. Um, I can't think of anything else right now that, that, that is in there. <laughs> we have, um, um, we use the, uh, the image build elements um, um, that we can then um, build an instance from. Right. We, 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 you can use the uh, triple O disk, disk image builder. Is there an alternative? Is there an alternative? Um, you can manually build one yourself. I mean, that's, that's entirely possible. Um, might take a lot of manual effort. Um, but it's possible, and uh, I've seen it where um, you can build it as a um, as a container, and you can you, you could end up building it and running it as in a, some kind of a container if you, if that if that is your virtualization that you're going to be using underneath. What was that, Amrith? You can use Packer, and you can use Disk Image Builder to build the containers. So you could use Docker, um, depending on, on what uh, Nova Hypervisor um, configuration you choose. And this and this uh, and what our demo is here, it's showing it with uh, the the um, the default KVM uh, hypervisor. All right. So we see um, so we see something else that just showed up after it turned active. Now we see a volume used. That's actually reporting back and telling you how much of that volume that we give it a one gig, it's using 0.1 gigs of that volume. So that you can then key off of that if you needed to for metrics or making sure, oh, I'm using, I'm using like 0.9 of my volume. I probably need to upgrade or I need to maybe increase my volume size for this, for this instance. Well, there's a resize volume command that we can send to this and we can resize that. And it'll go up to, for example, two gigs if we need that. You have a question, sir? It's still in build. Okay. Uh, it should. It shouldn't take too long. Uh, Amrith is uh, coming over to, to take a look at it for you. Yeah, it could. It could depend on the speed of your machine too. So the so the air may have a, a a little bit of an issue trying to trying to do this with um, limited resources, but but it's a trade off for being so thin and light, right? <laughs> yeah, you can. So so if it's taking a little bit, you can. Um, if you go into your screen, you can say screen dash x to go back into your into that screen session. Yeah. So we um, so in order to see this, I use a control A and then a double quote, and then you can in your screen session, and then you can see a list of all the um, the screen sessions going on. You go to the task manager, and you should you should be waiting until you get this uh, created test instance successfully. Um, so you should see that eventually in your in your task manager logs. If you don't see that yet, it's probably eventually getting there. So you got it, sir. Excellent. It'll take a little longer for some for some if in that case. All right, and I'll go back out of that. So let's see. What's so once we have a once we see that this uh, Trove instance went active. So let's um, do some uh, database management, or let's create some users and databases on this so that we can easily 
connect to it and test that out and show that it doesn't need anything more than, than uh, the, the API calls that are provided. So we have uh, Trove Database Create, and this takes in the, the instance name as a positional argument and the database name as a, another positional argument. So then we um, give that, and you probably get no, no uh, response back from that. It's just saying 202 OK without, without giving you back any um, response if it's successful. Then uh, to, to test and see that that was successful, then we see a database list uh, with demo. And then you should see that database name show up there. And then now that we created this database, we don't have any access to this database. We created that user one in the beginning, right? But it doesn't actually have access to this database because it hasn't been associated. So now we need to, there's a user grant access. So this is, this is in case where you have, um, you have a new user that comes on and they need access to certain databases or you add new databases and you need to give all your users access to that. So you could do this uh, if you had root access to your database, but this provides you the flexibility of not providing root access to, to certain users on that instance, and then you can provide it all through, through, your, um, through the API. And then we can test that we can actually SS, or use MySQL from the, from the host to this instance and use the username and password and see the databases there. So we have IP address of 10 one, or 10 zero zero two. Um, so what do we have? We have Trove database. What? How do we know what? The, the IP of the instance of the database. So the IP of the instance is going to be in that in the show call. So if you do Trove show um, demo, as we see up at the top of the screen here. We have Trove show demo, and then we see the IP address there. And so we see 10.0.0.2, and that's just typically the first one that you give whenever you're uh, creating, an, um, creating it in your, in your new, new user space. So Trove database list. Oh, I forgot positional argument. So let's uh, give it a, we have no databases. Um, so then we can say Trove create a database on demo my DB. You'll see nothing that comes back. We'll do another list. We'll see that database. Everybody see this? Everybody see this on your machines? Yes? Oh, you're still in building? OK. Yes? which uh, Neutron subnet is, is the Trove virtual machine on. That is on the default, um, the default network, um, which is the, the 10.0 space. So if, you want to, uh, plug it to if you wanted to plug it into a different one, you would, which the, the strategy of creating another one would be you create your other Neutron network. And then there's a, if you look in the Trove create, I'll show the, uh, we look at Trove Create, right? We see a, a list of uh, different options that we can pass into that. One is the NIC, dash dash NIC, and that one you can pass in a net ID and then equals whatever UUID of that network that you have. And so that way you can then pass it into this private private subnet that you have, and that will that will subnet it or isolate it away from it. Yes, if you're using Neutron. Yeah, in this in this dev stack we're using Nova networking, but yep, exactly. So, everybody see a database? Yeah. Having some trouble there? All right, we can get we can get somebody over there. <laughs> uh, one to zero dot two. User is what was my user? User one, dash p, password, password. Did I type it? Oh, there it goes. All right. So then you should be able to log into the instance like that, and you should see that you're in MySQL. 
And you should be able to say show um, databases. Databases, if I can type. Oh, I didn't grant access in my, in my example. So we see that. Um, so now we need to grant, wait, what was it? Grep, grant, user grant access, that's what it was. This is how I, how I hack through it. I grep for things, right? Um, trove user grants access. What was the, the list of commands there? So we need the instance name. Uh, we need the name of the, the user, and that would be uh, user1. We need the database, which is mydb. And then if we had other databases we were granting, we'd, we'd include those. Now we've uh, granted the access there. Now if I do, now if I log in, should be able to log into my SQL here and then do a show databases. We should see, should see the database. Yes, we do. Excellent. What is the equivalent of a grant wall? Um, this, this is a, the equivalent of grant um, that user access to your database. Um, not necessarily grant all, but because uh, you, you can insert, create, update, but not, um, not uh, yeah, you don't have grant access, so you can't grant somebody else access. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not per user, so you so you can configure this globally. Whenever you ac when you say hey, grant access to a user, what what data store has access to? So you can include if it's all or if it's grant or insert, insert update select whatever subset you would like of those uh, those permissions. All right, so everybody see the database there then. Who did not see the database whenever they were able, if they were able to log in? Able to not, or who saw it? The positive side? Yeah, let's be positive. Who saw it? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So then the next thing we can do is we can create another user um, and, and grant them access to this database. So we can actually include that in one step instead whenever we're, uh, we're creating this user. So we already have that database, MyDB. My so we can say, create a new user for, on the demo instance. Uh, we'll call this user2 and password2, and use the dash, uh, dash dash databases, and we can give it uh, the database that we created. And then whenever we log in with, with uh, this user2 and user2 password, then we should be able to see, the, see that same, same database. Yes, sir. OK. Uh, who is, where is root, or who is root? What's the question? So there's a, so we have a, a service user, admin, or root, root user. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a implicit, or it's a, a different name, it's not root, but it's a different na named user that we have, um, that, that basically allows us to make these calls into the, into the instance from the guest. Yeah, we, so we do, have a, we do have user access to this database from the guest. We have root access at that point. Um, and that's, in, that's, that's set up in the actually, uh, in the prepare, whenever we create this instance, that is, we create that um, user and, and secure that. Right, so it's only locked down to the local host. The only the local host um, um, 
uh, what is that, the host name of that user is only accessed from that, from that host, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir? It's uh, via RPC. It's all, all via RPC to the guest. That's um, not over SSH. It's through, it's through the Rabbit uh, connection that we have. Because the guest also has, has access to Rabbit to be able to um, say, hey, I'm basically to send messages back to conductor. And it's also bidirectional to uh, task manager as well to be able to know that and then, um, something is finished and, and can respond back to it. They listen to the conductor. Conductor. So conductor is basically just listening for all the, to all the uh, instances that are out in on the network, and it's basically just um, listening to, for the heartbeats. So because every guest has a heartbeat, that's like basically, hey, is the is your data store active, uh, or is it is it running? Is it am I able to connect to it? Everything look okay. Okay, it's active, right? So there's a heartbeat that's sent from the guest to, uh, periodically saying it's good, it's good. And all of a sudden, maybe, it, maybe uh, you run out of memory or something and that data store dies. All of a sudden, then we'll send a message back saying, all right, well, it's, er or it's, um, it's stopped. There's something, something wrong. So we change the state of, that, state of that instance in the database. So whenever you query... Um, the replication of the... So, excuse me. Yes. Listen to the. Uh, Listen right? to the uh, heartbeat of the heartbeat. of the guest. And die, when it dies, it will something like a replicate also because in, in normal, I think, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, when some node is dying, right? Auto failover. Auto failover replication. Replication. So the so you're asking about auto failover and replication for that. So there, if this in this case we have a single instance where there's no there's no replication across for uh, for MySQL. We're talking about the the guest instance there. Um, we have if if that instance dies, well we just we report back saying hey you don't have access to this to this instance anymore. Um, maybe you need to issue a restart or something to fix that. Um, maybe you need to maybe you need to do something more exhaustive than that. Um, that we do have access, we do have also a uh, a way of doing replication as well. So you can create create two nodes as master and a slave, and then we can if one if your master ends up falling off, then you can promote your slave. That we ha we have that ability as well through the the Trove API. Right, right now it's a manual failover. There's no auto failover. There's just a manual way of, and, and basically that by pulling what the, what the state of those instances are right now. Conductor is state. The conductor is basically just, basically all conductor does is just listens to all these instances and writes it to the database. It's just like, all right, we have, we have basically, instead of having every instance like uh, writing its own state or whatever, conductor is the central point of knowing or of writing those those database states. The Trove database, as in. Sure. Your MySQL instance is going to be here, okay? So in this Nova instance, you got MySQL running here, and you got the guest agent. All that Craig was talking about is the heartbeat from the guest agent saying, MySQL alive, alive, alive. That state must be written into this database because if somebody comes in from Horizon and says, give me the list of all the databases. You ran Trove Show. Where do we get that state from? We get it from here. 
how does the state of this database go here so that Trove Show is going to be able to catch it? The guest agent is going to run on MySQL to run MySQL ping. Success. It sends a message over the message bus. The conductor picks up that message, writes the status in here. It does that every so many seconds. There are other things which conductor does, like for example, if you change the root password, the response coming over from the guest agent to the conductor is going to be, in, when you do Trove root enable, the password is going to come over here, and you're going to get the password through so you can show it to the end user. So this is the path from the guest agent through to this database over the message bus. Your question earlier was, do you do it over SSH? No. Task manager never talks to this database directly. It always talks to the guest agent. Because realize, the task manager, as far as possible, should be database agnostic. This database may be MySQL, Postgres, Mongo, Cassandra, whatever the hell it is. This is the translation between databases. So the task manager is only going to talk to here. The response from here is going to go back over the message bus and get stored in persistent state. That's the reason why this is effectively part of the Trove control plane, even though it's running on the Nova instance. That answer your question, sir? Yeah. Thank you. Do you have another one, sir? So I'm just <coughs> if you use Neutron, so because this guest VM directly needs access to the rapid node, mm -hmm. the only way to do this is to provide a network. So right now the way in which you were to if you were to do this with Neutron, this guest instance is going to have two interfaces. Yeah. One interface is going to be connected onto your management network, one interface is going to be connected onto your public network. Your default, when you build an image for a trove, and we distribute images, there's images available on tarballs at openstack.org. The proper configuration would be to bind the network interface for your host database to the public interface and to restrict your guest agent to the management network. That way, nobody is going to be able to go from, you're, you're going to be able to have access from the guest agent to the message bus, and the database is never going to listen on the wrong interface. That's the separation you're going to have with Neutron. Currently, what you're using is a DevStack-based setup, which has Nova networking. Same thing with Neutron. I'm looking at the guest image, and it has a lot of pro configuration in EPC Pro. Correct. Who generated that? And is it specific to the dev stack that you're running here? So, so the question is, if you were to actually SSH into the instance, the stuff in Etsy Tro. OK, so here's what actually happens. The guest image has nothing of that. The bare image sitting on glass doesn't have any of that. When you run Trove Create, actually, if you look at the stuff in there, you realize that much of the stuff, there's, there's one which is called guest config or guest info. That's the ID for the guest. So when you do the Trove Create call, the task manager at runtime generates two files, and it uses file injection, cloud init, whatever you want, pushes that down here. Therefore, when this instance is booted using Nova, when the instance comes up, the first task which runs is going to find these files magically appear there. Yes, correct. Yeah, it's injected into it. No, yeah. I was afraid that you have to hard code. No, you do no. not have. No, you do. Those, those are two things which come in. Now, I will be very clear about something which Craig said earlier. The entire configuration you've got there is dev stack based. This is not a not an indication of a production network, production deployment of show. The very fact that you're able to SSH into this instance means this ain't a production setup. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's a no no from production perspective. <laughs> I should repeat the question. How many of you run DevStack in production? Anybody want to raise your hand now? Oh, I got two people raising their hands. Okay, right, all right. Excellent. Do we have any other questions around that? All right, so how many of you were actually able to get much of Trove up and running? Excellent. How many of you still have questions about Trove? <laughs> well, come on. Somebody must All have right. questions about Trove. Well, there's a bunch of us here. Go to the HP booth and find any of the HP folks. Go to the Red Hat booth. You can find Victoria there. Come to the Tesoro booth. Um, there's all of us who are going to be there. Happy to answer your questions. Otherwise, hash OpenStack Trove IRC. Um, hit us up. We'll give you whatever help we can. Yeah, that we're always there. So the question was about RDO uh, support. 
for Trove, and that was in in January. You said. But if you want to. In January. So that was the other question. So now it's going to have uh, like unsupported or something like that to install provisioning code. Are you coming? Mean you, now we cannot use RDO to install code. So we can use RDO to install code. We have a documentation for that, but it's like two weeks ago. So there are still things that are called more secure. Maybe. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. <laughs> so the question was uh, if there, if RDO supports Trove, and currently it's in tech preview. That means that you, we have the automation for it. You can run RDO with Trove, but it still is uh, there are some bugs we are fixing, and it may be not be still enough. But in general, we will release it uh, with full support for it and uh, you will be able to use it with the rest of your RDO infrastructure. That's answer the question? Yeah, yeah. Great. Excellent. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> this went till six? Hi. What? Okay, okay. Quick one. Yeah, so a couple. Um, is there a standard or recommended way to set up Trove so that the database instances and other Trove infrastructure is hidden from the users? What, what is that? <laughs> sure, the, so the question is, is there a standard way to install Trove so that the database instances are hidden from the infrastructure? Do you want to take it? I can take hidden it, whatever you want. Yeah. Hidden from the users. So in order to hide, hide those, um, the instances and everything from the user, um, there is a way. Um, there was, uh, I believe, there's uh, some docs that we that we put together as well for that um, on the on our wiki page uh, around Trove. Um, I think we probably need to highlight those a little bit more because those those are some questions that we constantly get. Uh, I'll make sure I actually I should take an I take an action right now of making sure that's on the front page of, of the of our wiki page for Trove. But um, but going forward with it, it's. Basically, it's changing the um, the uh, remotes remote access that we have um, to to Nova and to Sender and to and to the other clients that Trove is actually using to connect to um, uh, to uh, to the infrastructure, right? So you have Nova and Sender running. So and our and our task manager service connects to connects to those. Well, we override that with a with a uh, a different user so that kind of it basically kind of proxies it, right? So you look like it's it's you're coming in as your as user X, and then all of a sudden it turns into user admin, and then we have that connection to it. Um, basically, it's um, it's uh, overriding our remotes pi. So I think I've, I think I've seen that like we have. I guess. Let, let me let me try and take another crack at it. Okay, um, you want to do you want to keep the database instances? Out of the user's reach. Okay, Trove is a client of Nova, Cinder, Swift, Glance, and so on. Okay, the only way in which Trove communicates with those services is on their public APIs. One way in which you can deploy Trove in production is by saying that the Trove endpoint, the, the Nova endpoint which Trove must hit, is not the same endpoint which the end user is going to hit when they run a Nova list command. The other way in which you can do this is by saying that if you launch an instance, a Trove instance using your credentials, the Nova instance can be launched with a different user's credentials. Those are all configurable within Trove. At the end of the day, the thing which you want to prevent is an end user getting shell access to that instance. That's the thing which you want to avoid. There's multiple ways in which you can get shell access to it. But in most of the cases that I've seen people deploying Trove in production, the most common thing is there's a different uh, a set of access credentials which the user has in order to launch the instance. They don't directly use their Keystone credentials. There's a different veneer on top of the uh, user interface which they use. So those are kind of three of the different ways in which we can do it. We have much of this stuff documented. Maybe it should, it should be highlighted more. You want to say? To who uses? 
So even if he creates a keystone domain on the fly, the question is, is the end user going to be able to see it if he or she runs a Nova list command? The answer is they will be able to. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Yes. Yes. As of as of Liberty, Trove can deploy. As of Liberty. Liberty. Yes. That was something we worked on. This this cycle. So. The guy in the green shirt wrote the code, so it's a done work for him. <laughs> 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 yeah, you can't. You can't. You can find me. I'm sure. But yes, if you have any questions around that, I'm. The, the image is similar, right? It's very similar. It's it's just the package that's different, really. We have a, it's the Percona extra DB cluster package uh, or cluster server package. And that's, that's installed and that includes uh, the extra DB uh, backup as the uh, replication uh, type and then using Glare as well. One last question. I think we're over time here, so go ahead. Uh, we deployed um, a MySQL database in version 5.6 or something and then spawns um, a new um, year um, uh, virtual machine. Who manages this virtual machine later on, patching, um, so lifecycle management? Is this the focus of um, your project or is this who, who needs to do this later on? So, so the idea is who manages this, this Trove MySQL database after it's launched? The idea is that Trove would Trove would manage this automatically. That's the goal of the project, is to where you can just kind of fire and forget, and then, oh, my database is always going to be there. There's, uh, we're not all the way there. It's, there's still some manual steps to that. Um, we're going to be adding like monitoring to this to where you can get, then get alerts to, uh, of, um, of what, what's going on with your database, basically tying in a bunch of those events that we have, that we've built into, into Trove. Um, but, to answer the question currently, it's it's going to be it's going to rely on um, the user, and then if if the user can't handle it, then it goes to the operator of the of the system. For upgrades, you would have to do the Nova up rebuild yourself with the new version. And for kind of five point or six point zero comes out, you have to do that manually and then run it zero. Right. So if you were going to upgrade that from five six to six point zero MySQL, for example, or Pagona, then you would have. Uh, then you would have to rebuild that image. Sure. And there's not, I would say in part, partially of that, there's no guarantee that the data between two different versions of, of MySQL or versions of flavors of MySQL, that it will work. So highly recommend backing that up and testing that. <laughs> All right, I think that wrap, about wraps up uh, for the time. I appreciate everybody coming. It's great to see all, all, the, all the new faces and very great questions that everybody asked. I, we really appreciate that. If you have any other uh, feedback or questions, you can ask any of us up here. Uh, we're, we'll be glad to, glad to talk to you about this. Okay, one last thing. How do we safely shut down the, uh, the, the desktop? Don't the desktop. bother. You got a snapshot. Yeah, you can just like, you can go back to that snapshot and r run through it every month. <laughs> you can pause it. You can pause it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.